I'm Sam Telford. Uh, I'm a professor of infectious disease and global health here at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, and uh, even though I'm known mainly uh, for my work with ticks, uh, I have branched out and I also do some mosquito work. Uh, and uh, was asked uh, by uh, Lois Lunowitz, who's the health agent for uh, the town of Grafton, uh, to provide a, uh, an overview of mosquito transmitted infections uh, and what we can do about it. Uh, how can we prevent risk uh, and, uh, or reduce risk? Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of people have this idea that mosquito-borne infection is like a flash of lightning, like being struck by lightning. Uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, and in fact, uh, this, this puts a face on it. This is Kelly LaBelle a picture of Kelly LaBelle, who died uh, back in 2005. Uh, uh, she was a 20-year-old uh, Newton resident, uh, and uh, one day came in and said, Dad, I don't feel well. Uh, and uh, like any dad, he, he said, well, you know, take these uh, uh, ibuprofen or Advil or whatever it was, uh, and you'll feel better in the morning. And sad to say, seven days later, she was uh, uh, in a coma and they had to make the very difficult decision to pull life support uh, and uh, uh, this has obviously affected uh, uh, her family uh, to the point that they started uh, uh, raising funds for a small foundation uh, and what they do today is dispense those funds uh, as a travel award to a promising graduate student to attend the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene meeting uh, someone who's working on arthropod-borne viruses. Uh, but uh, uh, Rick LaBelle, the, the father, uh, police uh, uh, detective, uh, goes around and, and spreads the message that society needs to take a triple E seriously, that even though it is rare, it can happen to anyone. And there's no way to really predict where and when it might strike. Uh, and his most important message is use repellent when you go outside. And so I just, I just put that up there as it, it's, it's not meant to scare you, but rather to point out that it can happen to anybody. Now let's see, how does this work? Okay. So uh, uh, what I want to do is go over Eastern Equine Encephalitis uh, and West Nile virus as infections uh, here uh, in Massachusetts, tell you a little bit about them. Uh, and then go on to uh, really the main bulk of the presentation, which is prevention. Uh, the Eastern Equine Encephalitis, most people don't realize it's the most dangerous arthropod transmitted virus in North America, one of the most dangerous viruses we know about. Uh, the case fatality rate is 35%. Uh, and uh, this is up there in the same ballpark as something like Ebola. Ebola is up in the 40 to 60%. So it's not all that different. Uh, and uh, those who survive uh, have severe neurologic uh, sequelae. Uh, and it's said that uh, caring for the survivors costs us an awful lot of money. In fact, a study was done uh, of uh, seven survivors, and the average cost was $3 million a piece. And what is not counted is that 35% that, that is the immediate mortality. The people who survive for some time, debilitated, eventually die of causes related to their initial illness. Uh, and they should actually be counted as mortality due to Eastern equine encephalitis as well. So the case fatality rate is much higher. It causes a severe encephalitis in humans and in horses. Uh, and uh, uh, like many other insect or tick transmitted infections, it starts as a flu-like illness with fever, chills, and muscle aches. Uh, and, but unlike most tick-borne uh, illnesses or the other mosquito transmitted infections, it rapidly progresses to headache, drowsiness, convulsions, and coma. Uh, and uh, there is no specific treatment. Any treatment is, symptom is, uh, is uh, supportive. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not just horses. There have been cases reported of, of uh, Eastern equine encephalitis in dogs. Uh, and uh, uh, there is no licensed vaccine for humans. The US military, because uh, Eastern equine encephalitis is uh, on the list of, of agents 
thought to be useful for bioterrorism uh, has developed countermeasures and there is a vaccine that the army has used that we believe is actually pretty effective. It's, it's pretty much the same one as that which is given to horses. Uh, there's a combined West Nile virus, Eastern Equine Encephalitis vaccine, which is quite effective. And in fact, anyone who's a horse owner who does not vaccinate and they live in Eastern US, they really should. Uh, fortunately for us, Eastern Equine Encephalitis is a very rare infection. Uh, in comparison, so we have an incidence rate of about 0.2 cases per 100,000. And in comparison with something like Lyme disease, where you have 7.9 cases per 100,000, or breast cancer, 123 cases per 100,000. So in the general scheme of things, it doesn't appear as if Eastern Equine Encephalitis uh, is much more than a lightning uh, flash. Uh, but on the other hand, for Kelly LaBelle and for, for the, uh, the uh, rare individual, uh, it certainly is one uh, with a huge out, uh, uh, negative outcome. The ecology is very interesting. Here we have uh, a virus which typically cycles between birds uh, by a mosquito called Culicida melanura. Uh, and this mosquito uh, is found in very uh, specific habitats, namely red maple or Atlantic cedar swamps. Uh, these uh, trees form uh, 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 cavities under their roots that hold water and the larval stages of mosquitoes are found in those holes, and, and pretty much only in those holes. Uh, and so typically, eastern equine encephalitis cycles silently in these swamps between birds and the bird-feeding mosquito, Culicida melanera. Well, what happens uh, later on in the season when there's a lot of virus around in, in birds is that there are other mosquitoes, such as the cattail mosquito, uh, don't mind the, the long scientific names, uh, where uh, those mosquitoes really don't care what they feed on. They'll feed on birds, they'll feed on mammals, uh, and they will do what we call bridging. They bridge the infection from a silent cycle in nature to humans or horses. They go and feed on a bird. Uh, mosquitoes take multiple blood meals. They take a blood meal, they lay eggs, they need another blood meal to lay another clutch of eggs. And so they can feed on a bird one day, four or five days later, uh, uh, they may go and find, or, or even a week later, they may find uh, additional uh, need for blood and feed on something else. And so it takes the infection out of this silent cycle and, and puts it out uh, where horses and humans are. Uh, and, and one of the, the things that we're, and what I like to try to do is sort of highlight some of the research that we do here at, at the, the coming school, uh, things that we don't really uh, uh, publicize too much. But this uh, uh, idea uh, that the cattail mosquito is, is important for uh, 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 bridging the infection from a silent cycle in nature to people and, and, and horses, uh, as I'll, I'll point out in a minute, the, the ecology of e Eastern Equine Encephalitis seems to be changing. There are far more, there's far more activity there's far more risk to humans uh, within the last half dozen years or so. Uh, and uh, the question is why? Uh, and one of the reasons may be related to an unintended consequence of stormwater uh, management. That is, EPA has mandated that uh, any new development ha that has gone in in the last 10 to 20 years uh, account for runoff of, of water uh, from concrete surfaces. And that's typically into what are known as retention ponds. And those retention ponds, a lot of people like to plant them uh, so that they look nice and they'll eventually become uh, artificial wetlands. Well, the fact of the matter is, that's really not terribly interesting to a mosquito, but uh, the, the newly constructed ones. But once it starts to get some vegetation, it's a great place for breeding mosquitoes because the natural predators are not there yet. And so, uh, one of the things they like to plant these things with is cattails and other emergent type vegetation. And this cattail mosquito gets its name because it has a very peculiar habit of actually uh, the larvae are not in the water column, the immature forms of the mosquito, but rather down towards the roots of these plants and they pierce with their abdomen the roots of these plants and breathe through the stems of these cattails. So it's very difficult to control these mosquitoes uh, uh, preemptively, that is by uh, attacking the larvae. 
Uh, and so is there a relationship between putting all of these retention ponds up into suburban sites uh, and perhaps bridging by the cattail mosquito? So that's a question that we're actively looking at. Massachusetts, oddly, is, is, a, is a focus for eastern equine encephalitis, uh, but even from year to year, the risk sites seem to be uh, 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 expanding. Typically, uh, it's always been associated with southeastern Massachusetts and what we call the Hockamock Swamp, uh, but there have been in the past little air foci developing in central Massachusetts and the North Shore, and now New Hampshire. Uh, and Vermont and Maine also are starting to see a transmission activity. But what has happened is that typically it used to come uh, and uh, be around in mosquitoes for two or three years at a time and then it would disappear uh, and then go away for about ten, uh, seven to ten years and then come back again. Well, as you note here, the, the intervals between uh, disappearing and appearing have greatly shortened in the last 20 years or so. And the question is why? We'd love to know. Uh, and uh, uh, this particular graph shows exactly when the, the, the transmission activity is being detected. Uh, we're seeing most of this uh, uh, during uh, 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 the later summer, uh, starting in uh, uh, late July, August, uh, and early September. Uh, and those intervals uh, between uh, transmission activity, and also the actual pattern of when the virus is being detected in mosquitoes changes from year to year in, 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 these, in these sites. So things are happening and we're trying to understand why that is. And if we, try, if we understood what was happening at the level of the ecology, perhaps we can come up with more specific ways of preventing infection. West Nile virus uh, is, is also what we call an arthropod-borne virus or arbovirus, and it's related to known, uh, pests, uh, known plagues of humans, uh, such as yellow fever, dengue, Japanese encephalitis, and St. Louis encephalitis, things that go across continents in huge epidemics periodically. Uh, and uh, uh, when it appeared in the late 1990s, uh, native birds which had never seen West Nile virus before were, were decimated. Uh, those of you who are bird watchers uh, know that an awful lot of native species here were, were essentially disappeared and there were places where you couldn't see a single crow or blue jay. Uh, the corvid birds, those related to crows and blue jays, seem to be uh, severely affected. Uh, just as with eastern equine encephalitis, domestic ruminants, horses, uh, alpacas, uh, things like that are, uh, 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 they die uh, unless they're vaccinated. Uh, and in fact, dogs can also sustain neurologic disease. Uh, and this iceberg of disease, uh, a lot of people say, well, yes, West Nile virus can be fairly common, uh, but fortunately for us, 80% of the infections are asymptomatic. That is, a person can get bitten by an infected mosquito get the virus but never feel any sign of illness and never any chronic uh, uh, implications of that infection. Only 20% of the people actually get sick and most of those are with what we call West Nile fever which is a self-limited fever, chills, headache, fatigue, nausea and rash. Again, not much distinction between a West Nile virus, early eastern equine encephalitis and any of the tick-borne infections and in fact uh, flu uh, manifest the same way. Uh, but then a very small fraction, 1%, uh, will, will have what we call ner central nervous system disease uh, and uh, they will manifest with meningitis or encephalitis, stiff neck, uh, confusion, headache, diz uh, dizziness, uh, and sometimes progressing to coma. 10% of, of that 1%, so uh, very, very few cases, uh, uh, of all the people who are exposed actually develop uh, West Nile vir virus neurologic disease. But now come two new syndromes uh, that are being increasingly uh, reported and described, flaccid paralysis. Uh, sometimes there is no acute illness that's discernible uh, and uh, there's a sudden onset of weakness of one limb uh, with no numbness but some pain. And this is not age associated. Even younger people can be infected uh, and manifest in this manner. So the question is of this iceberg, wh where, where 
does this fit in on this iceberg of infection? And then finally, even more disturbing, uh, is the possibility of chronic kidney disease. That is, in uh, rodent models of infection, it was noted very quickly that rodents, such as hamsters in the laboratory, would maintain virus, those that survived, would maintain virus uh, for a long time in their body and shed it in their urine. All of us were interested in that because it's a mechanism to keep it going around uh, for long periods of time in the woods. Uh, but uh, uh, it also has implications for humans and, in fact, uh, chronic nephritis, uh, kidney disease, uh, manifesting as protein in the urine or blood cells in the urine, has been associated with West, Wild, West Nile virus exposure. And the question is, how common is this? And are the people who are asymptomatic, do some of them have the prospect of developing kidney disease in the future? And so uh, even though a lot of people say, well, we don't need to worry too much about West Nile virus, 80% of the cases are asymptomatic. Uh, and we've even heard some yahoos in the audience uh, at, at mosquito control uh, a presentation say, well, you know, uh, who cares about West Nile virus? It only infects a few old people. Uh, it's a wonder they, they actually think along those lines, because one day they too will become old. Uh, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is we no longer can point to that 80% asymptomatic rate as a, as a reason to not try to prevent uh, mosquito bites. And, and just the, the, the ivory tower in me wants to remind everyone, and this is a very generic slide, when we hear about disease, there is no textbook case of disease. If I were to take ticks or mosquitoes from my lab, that were deliberately infected and put one on each person in this room, some of you would be asymptomatic. Some of you would have a typical course of illness with fever, chills, muscle aches, and so forth, and some of you would have severe disease and maybe even die. That pattern of infection, the so-called uh, 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 asymptomatic to symptomatic ratio and the, the disease curve is specific for each disease. And so when you hear someone uh, say West Nile uh, virus always presents this way, remember that everybody is different in terms of their physiology and how they respond to infection. Some of us shrug off a cold that puts someone in bed for two weeks. And so that, that kind of variation needs to be taken into account whenever we think about disease. So when someone says Ebola virus is this terrible thing, well, it could be, but what, what really is the epidemic curve? Uh, uh, what does the uh, uh, cur disease curve look like? The West Nile virus transmission cycle, very uh, much like uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, uh, it's a bird-maintained infection, that is mosquito-feeding birds keep it going between birds, uh, and only uh, rarely does it exit, exit or bridge from that cycle. Uh, and there's been some debate as to uh, what the actual nature of that bridge is. Uh, is it this house mosquito of what we call Culex pipiens, which is uh, really peridomestic. It likes to be around houses. It likes sewers. It likes really filthy water. So this is not what you're going to have breeding uh, it, uh, in an area where a beaver has dammed up uh, a, a property. Uh, this is directly related to you and your home. Uh, how clean you keep your gutters, whether you have swimming pools uh, full of water, uh, whether you have flower pots that are overly wet, uh, and so this is one of the things that one can do is to prevent a West Nile virus from being transmitted around your home is to try to reduce the Culex pipiens or house mosquito populations around your homes. Uh, uh, West Nile virus is actually one of the most common, it's the most common vector-borne uh, infection next to Lyme disease. It's a transfusion hazard and there's certain uh, counties in, in the United States where uh, as many as 10% uh, or 15% of the population has been exposed to West Nile virus. Typically, we have good indicators of this. When you see dead birds around, particularly dead crows or blue jays, uh, that's a good uh, uh, hint that uh, someone needs to be looking for virus. Uh, and and for, again, this is because our native birds have not been uh, used to the, seeing this infection. There's an old the rule in microbiology, the longer an animal has uh, been associated with an infection, if they uh, have adapted to it through the years by, natural, by evolution, 
uh, they and, and the infection come to an agreement and decide not to harm each other, whereas if you have new associations, uh, you're much more likely to see disease. But most people don't realize that West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis are not the only things out there. And in fact, there are far more infections that are common. Uh, one of these is vastly understudied, lacrosse virus. Uh, it is maintained by chipmunks uh, and a tree hole breeding mosquito, Aedes trizeriatus. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, over at Clark University, Todd Livedahl has a really nice long-term project on uh, tree hole mosquitoes in the cemeteries of Worcester, because a lot of the containers in the cemeteries are great breeding sites for uh, Aedes uh, trizeriatus. Uh, and uh, so anywhere where you see chipmunks and you have a lot of older trees, uh, you might have a cycle of transmission between uh, chipmunks and mosquitoes of this virus. It usually causes disease only in younger children, uh, and, but it can be a severe disease. Fortunately, around here, it, doesn't, uh, it hasn't been so common as to uh, be discovered. We know it's around. We, we go out and we sample human populations and test their serum for antibody to exposure to some of these things. And we do know that it's here in Massachusetts. Uh, it's just not uh, studied very, very uh, uh, frequently. Another virus, this one is extremely common, Jamestown Canyon virus, and the reason it's common is because of this. Uh, this uh, graph shows you that early in the year, the fawns are all uninfected, but within a matter of a month, virtually all become infected with this California group virus. Uh, it usually causes mild uh, fevers, stiff neck, headache for about seven to 10 days, and then it goes away. Uh, a companion virus, Cache Valley virus, same group of viruses, is known to cause uh, a mal malformed uh, uh, off offspring in, in ruminants, uh, whether it has any influence on uh, 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 birth abnormalities in humans is not clear. But in a study that we did on Nantucket, 10% of the people uh, presenting at the Nantucket Cottage Hospital had antibody to Jamestown Canyon virus. Uh, and so, again, it's not one of those things people look for. It's not one of those things you can do anything about anyway, except prevent mosquito bites. It's transmitted by perhaps the most common woodland mosquito, Aedes vexans, uh, and uh, other of the woodland species. And of course, wherever you see deer, you're likely to see this virus being transmitted. So th those are the, that's the cast of characters. Those of you who are, uh, 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 have companion animals, uh, dogs, uh, know that you still have to give uh, your, your dog heartworm medication during the mosquito months. Uh, and so that's yet another reason to try to promote uh, uh, measures against mosquitoes. Uh, the CDC has had a, uh, a competition every year uh, for uh, the best poster done by ele elementary school kids in their Fight the Bite campaign. Uh, and uh, this is the sort of thing that we need to, to uh, uh, pick up on in every community across Massachusetts is to participate in the Fight the Bite competition because in doing so you educate children who are really the people we need to protect the most. Just as a refresher, the mosquito life cycle uh, you start with the adult mosquito. They're males and females. Only the females lay eggs, take a blood meal and lay eggs. The male mosquitoes uh, feed on nectar. They need sugar sources. So they'll go to plants uh, and flowers and, and uh, uh, take sugar there. The females also take sugar, but in order to reproduce, in order to lay eggs, they need the fat that comes from blood. Uh, and they, they find that. Uh, they'll, they'll deposit their eggs about a week later, uh, and each mosquito species has its own preference on where it's going to be laying its eggs. The larvae hatch in a couple days, uh, and then there are three uh, main stages, uh, four main stages of larval development, uh, and all of this is temperature dependent. If it's cold, the developmental cycle is retarded. That is, it could take twice as long or three times as long to get from little first instar to just about to be pupae than it is at warmer temperatures. And so I think that sort of hindered us early on this, this summer is that some of the, the days and nights were pretty cold and that retarded a lot of the mosquito development. 
the, uh, the end stage larvae will, uh, the fourth stage larvae will turn into pupae. Uh, these uh, mosquitoes, like butterflies, undergo what we call complete metamorphosis. Uh, and then after a period of days, as a pupa at the, the surface of the water, uh, the adult mosquito emerges. Uh, takes a couple days to get hungry, uh, and then uh, we'll see coast, and you have the cycle go on again. So understanding that life cycle is critical to understanding how we might prevent uh, uh, a lot of mosquitoes around our homes. And I say that there, there are plenty of mosquitoes out here. This, this uh, uh, list comes from the Central Mass Mosquito Control Project uh, website, where they update in real time their collections for each week. Uh, and you'll see uh, this is a, a small sampling of the mosquitoes that we have around here. Uh, and these numbers change from week to week. Uh, uh, this was a couple weeks ago where we had uh, uh, some of these mosquitoes, uh, uh, melanera, were, were more, more uh, uh, common, uh, and cattail mosquitoes were common, Cochlitidae perturbans. Uh, but things such as uh, Culex pipiens, uh, Culex species, were less common. And these numbers fluctuate from week to week. Uh, there are trends throughout the summer. Uh, but when one says mosquito control, you've got to remember that there is this huge list of kinds of mosquitoes out there. And some of them aren't terribly relevant to us. Uh, 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 some of the, uh, if it weren't for the fact that uh, Culex pipiens transmits West Nile virus in natural cycles, we would pretty much ignore them because typically they don't attack humans. They're bird feeders. But because they serve to transmit virus among birds and, and increase the number of infected birds, thereby increasing the chances that one of these bridge vectors will feed on a bird and then feed on someone, we need to make sure that, that Culex pipiens breeding is reduced, but how to attack Culex pipiens is different than how one would attack Cochlutidae perturbans or, for that made matter, Aedes vexans, the woodland mosquito. And so uh, mosquito control is not just going out after the generic mosquito. You have to have very good knowledge of what the species are and what their ecology and life cycle is. How do you prevent mosquito bites? Everything starts here. This is really the most important step, is at the individual level. It does mean constant vigilance. You've got to do this all the time. You have to, to sort of pound it into your head and into your kid's head. Uh, try to avoid outdoor activities uh, between dusk and dawn. Uh, most mosquitoes are, are most active at that time, but it's not a hard and fast rule. There are what we call day-biting mosquitoes. And anyone who's worked in the yard knows that you can get bitten just fine during the daytime. But those are just two or three species out of that huge list. Uh, and the question that we have as public health people is, how significant are the day biters relative to the night biters in terms of transmitting infectious agents? <clears throat> and that question has not been determined. And the reason that's important is how we respond to them. That is, with the day biters, we pretty much have to preempt, that is, go after the developing stages, because one cannot use adulticiding or spraying during the daytime. The EPA has ruled that you cannot spray uh, in the daytime. It has to be after dusk, because otherwise you kill bees. Uh, and so that greatly ties our hands in trying to attack adult mosquitoes. Now, all of this goes out the window with the homeowner. The individual homeowner can go down to Home Depot and buy a fogger and apply it during the daytime. Of course, a lot of bees are going to die then, but you know, that's an individual choice. Uh, if you have to be outdoors uh, when mosquitoes are active, wear long sleeve shirts and pants. That's not a very practical recommendation, especially on a day like today. Uh, it's nice to think about, and in fact, believe it or not, there are mosquitoes that can bite right through your clothing. Uh, and so if you, if you want to rely on this one, it's, it'd be good if you uh, uh, applied what we call permethrin uh, to the clothing. Our military uniforms all have this chemical in the fibers of the clothing, uh, and that will have a slight repellent effect. Uh, and, and so you can have your outdoor clothes uh, and the, the nice thing about the permethrin-treated clothing for your outdoors clothing is that it also is highly protective for ticks. The ticks crawl on it and they die within three hours. And so you get two, two for one protection there. 
the, the, the basis for most of our uh, uh, protection uh, is uh, repellent, and uh, regardless of what you hear in, in, in on the internet or from uh, people uh, who uh, are afraid of chemicals, uh, DEET is our best weapon against uh, mosquitoes. <coughs> You, you should use a repellent that contains DEET. Uh, you should follow the directions on the label. It can be toxic if overused, but then again, if you swallowed a whole container of salt, you wouldn't be doing too well either. Uh, if uh, uh, there are recommendations for not using high concentrations of DEET on ch little children, and in fact, most of the adverse events come from mothers who are over anxious about mosquito bites, applying it to an infant and literally drenching that infant. And that's where the toxicity comes in. Uh, there are certain formulations, and I'll talk about that one in the next slide. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, there are alternatives. And in, in fact, uh, picaridin, IR325, uh, uh, and uh, oil of lemon eucalyptus are all touted as, as alternatives. They do have some efficacy, but they don't last as long on your skin as DEET will in repelling mosquitoes, and you need to reapply frequently. Uh, so, and, and once you're inside, obviously, there's no reason to keep it on your skin. It, you know, if, if uh, you can wash it off, wash it off. Uh, children really are our main concern. How, how are you going to protect them from getting bitten up by mosquitoes? And, and, and uh, often it helps just to use netting, mechanical protection. Uh, mosquito nets exist as a, uh, for a reason. If you've got a stroller, uh, it's not going, it, it probably won't, uh, uh, the, the, the child won't mind if there's a mosquito net over uh, the stroller. And then uh, important uh, thing in, in, in this time uh, when mosquitoes are, are really uh, coming to their peak is, is to make sure that you fix any holes in your screens. It's surprising how little of a hole they need to get into your, into your house. Uh, because when you're asleep, they will go after you. Let's talk a little more about DEET. Uh, and, and I do urge people who have questions about DEET to uh, uh, consult uh, uh, EPA and uh, other uh, uh, agencies that are tasked with evaluating the, the uh, harmfulness of chemicals. The National Pesticide Information Center and XTOXnet out of Cornell have excellent summaries of the literature of the scientific literature on repellents. It was developed by the military for obvious reasons. Uh, it works very nicely on mosquitoes. There's apparently a uh, receptor on the antenna that uh, picks up noxious chemicals uh, and it, it keeps mosquitoes away from those substances. It's very widely used. It's said that a third of the American population each summer applies DEET to themselves, apparently 400 million doses a summer. Uh, and uh, uh, the suggestion on the internet is that one in 100 million uh, doses will, will result in seizures. Well, the fact of the matter is the, the association is not proven. Uh, that is, people with seizures may have uh, used DEET, but they may also have been exposed to something else, and that's not clear. However, in the laboratory, it is known that uh, uh, DEET can be a nerve stimulus inhibitor, an acetylcholine esterase activity uh, inhibitor. The EPA classifies it as slightly toxic. You would have to eat 30 grams of it, that is an ounce or more, in order to uh, come anywhere near dying, uh, and it's not carcinogenic. Uh, I did mention that, and, and this is a timeline, this is a, a, a diagram showing that if you have to use uh, lower concentrations of DEET, it's very it's, uh, it's good practice to reapply frequently, whereas if you use those higher concentrations, uh, you can go longer between applications. I use this product, Ultrathon, uh, and I have no stock in this, I, I, but I use it because it's the civilian version of the military repellent. The military developed a version that is micro-encapsulated. Uh, and so instead of off or cutter or one of those, which is just the raw chemical going directly on your skin, it can penetrate your skin. Anybody who's touched a, a plastic, uh, something plastic after applying cut, uh, off, knows that it melts plastic. 
Uh, but if you use this stuff, it's encapsulated in little uh, uh, lipid beads on your skin. It holds the volatility. It keeps sending the signal out to the mosquitoes, but it doesn't get into your skin. And it sits on your skin. It lasts longer at a lower concentration. So this is, this is a very, the military has used this for, our, for 15 years, and this is the civilian version. <clears throat> so that's personal protection, and you have to do this every day when the mosquitoes are around. Uh, well, what else can you do to try to, uh, uh, you, you can't rely on just one thing. It'd be, uh, although if there's one thing you want to do, it's, it's use repellent. Uh, you can do things around your home, and, and the saying is, if there's a quarter inch of water or more in, 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 in a container for four days or more, mosquitoes will breed and make you sore. Uh, dispose of uh, any containers around your yards uh, that have water, or at least turn them upside down. Uh, uh, discarded tires uh, need to be removed uh, because the water that's in them, a perfect breeding site, uh, especially for those mosquitoes that like those hole type breeding situations. Uh, clean clogged roof gutters. I know it's, it's tough. In fact, I know about all of this and it's hard to get me up on the ladder twice a year to clean out the gutters. And every time I do, I'm shocked at seeing how many larvae are up there in my gutter. Uh, uh, turn over, if you have kids, turn over the wading pools, turn over your barrels. Again, four days is, is enough to start to see larvae. Uh, in, those, uh, in those bodies of water. Uh, if you have bird baths, change the water frequently. That's good for the birds anyway. Uh, and if you have ornamental ponds, make sure they're aerated. And, and if you can, put some fish in there. Uh, 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 foreclosed homes uh, are a source of mosquito breeding. Uh, they have to be kept properly maintained and chlorinated and, and so uh, if you have a foreclosed home in your neighborhood and you haven't seen anyone come around to maintain it, uh, talk to the Board of Health and, and perhaps the Board of Health can have something done about it. Uh, and then finally, uh, 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 if at all possible, uh, eliminate standing water on your property. There's a lot of chatter out there about alternatives. Uh, everybody says mosquito magnets have some, uh, are great in, in reducing mosquitoes around homes. Maybe, but the other thing is uh, there's a flip side to that. All of the, the mosquito magnet acts by attracting mosquitoes. It's liberating carbon dioxide and heat and water vapor. So you may also just be attracting a lot of mosquitoes in from neighboring yards. Uh, but if you can afford them, you can try. Uh, it's very satisfying to see the big bag of mosquitoes or, or midges or something in, in the bottom. Uh, citronella torches don't really work. Uh, ultrasonic repellers, zappers, other devices, they really don't work. Uh, and there's absolutely no scientific basis to the idea that bats, dragonflies, birds, or any other control, biocontrol actually works. The, the bat thing is particularly egregious. Uh, the, the actual information comes from some a guy in Texas in the 1920s who denied that smallpox uh, was person-to-person -person transmission. He thought it was bed bug transmitted. Uh, and he uh, necropsied. He'd opened up a couple bats that he'd found dead and found uh, a few dozen mosquitoes in one of them. And he had one of these huge emergence type caves near him where literally millions of bats came out. And he made the calculation in a chapter in this manifesto on how smallpox is caused by bed bugs, uh, where he extrapolated from that one bat to the millions and millions in the cave and said, uh, <coughs> kilograms of mosquitoes are being eaten by bats. And that's the origin of that so-called fact. There is no evidence, whatever. It's a nice idea to put bat houses around your homes, but again, as I was talking uh, <coughs> to someone before this uh, uh, talk, uh, it's a little iffy to promote the main source of rabies to humans around your homes. Bats are the main source of rabies. <coughs> In Massachusetts, we're blessed to have what we call mosquito control districts or mosquito control projects. <clears throat> These are uh, under the Department of Agricultural Resources. Uh, there, there are nine of them. Uh, and uh, 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 they service uh, large areas of eastern Massachusetts. 
uh, and uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, the structure is that a town votes to belong uh, and the costs uh, required to service that town are based upon the size of the town and, 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 and un under a, a, a Department of Agricultural Resources <coughs> formula. Uh, and uh, an assessment is taken each year from the, the, the local aid or cherry sheet. <coughs> and so uh, certain towns belong, certain towns don't. Uh, those people in eastern Massachusetts uh, that have mosquito, uh, organized mosquito control uh, are in various colors. Uh, we're serviced in Central Mass by Central Mass Mosquito Control Project uh, and uh, uh, based in Northboro. Uh, and uh, uh, the extent of services done uh, by mosquito control is greatly underappreciated. Uh, for most people, these organized projects are said to be simply spray and pray. They, they, they just go out and spray. That's not true, although spraying is done. 80 to 90% of all that spraying, however, is customer driven. That is, you can call up, if your town belongs, you can call up or email and say, I'm having a party on Saturday. Can you come in and uh, spray our neighborhood? Uh, and they'll come by with a truck. Uh, they can't go into your backyard by individually, but they'll come by and, and spray uh, and try to, uh, to uh, reduce the number of mosquitoes that are around. It's a temporary measure. You get relief for two or three days, and then a new brood of mosquitoes emerges, and you have to do it again. <coughs> a small fraction of this is, is done in, uh, uh, for abating nuisance at sporting events, uh, and, when, and uh, when there is virus activity, uh, this, uh, uh, this can be done and intensified to try to reduce the number of infected mosquitoes. And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But I, I hasten to, to mention, nuisance control really is a misnomer. It's public health because any mosquito that is out there is potentially a vector. We just have no way of knowing. The fewer mosquitoes, the less likely it is, even at a very low incidence, uh, the even lower possibility of getting infected. <clears throat> Central Mass Mosquito Control has a fantastic website, a great source of information. Uh, the, the project has eight uh, different uh, 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 tasks uh, that it does, uh, and adulticiding or spraying is only one of them. Uh, most of the efforts go towards actually preventing mosquitoes from breeding or uh, developing, that is larviciding. Source reduction is actually reducing the habitat or modifying the habitat to make it less conducive to mosquito breeding. Wetlands restoration is, is directed at historic uh, sites, that is uh, year after year these sites are known to produce mosquitoes and often it's due to something as simple as a clogged drain, uh, tr clogged drainage and so all someone has to do is come and rake out the debris and reestablish flow and that's all there is to it. Uh, public education and surveillance are, are also uh, uh, very important objectives. Uh, surveillance, mosquito traps are set. Uh, every week, uh, every day, uh, people go out and collect them. Mosquitoes are sorted and sent to the Department of Public Health for testing for West Nile virus and Eastern Equine Encephalitis virus. And in real time, these numbers are, are put down on the website. And you can see this is from last week, uh, where they look at uh, uh, some of the, the more common species, and you can see that uh, 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 you, the changes in the numbers over the, the weeks and over last year. So some of them, Aedes vexans, the woodland mosquito, there are far more this year than were, there were last year. But some of them, such as Culicida melanera, the, the, the main vector of eastern equine encephalitis, is actually down. Does that mean maybe that we won't see eastern this year? Don't know because this is just central mass. Most of the activity is actually out uh, in southeastern Massachusetts. So all of this information is publicly available, uh, including some great weather reports. <clears throat> Larva sighting is the mainstay of mosquito control that is preventing development of mosquitoes. Uh, it, it, it very uh, non-technically, everybody knows about mosquito dunks. Uh, essentially, these are, are materials that, are con that contain a bacterium <clears throat> the bacterium uh, is uh, liberated into the water uh, e either on corn cobs or on these donut shaped uh, 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 compressed fiber uh, objects. The, the, 
the bacteria are liberated in the water, they're eaten by mosquito larvae, and a toxin is liberated in the gut of the mosquito, and that toxin is specific only to killing those organisms that have what we call an alkaline gut, a gut with a higher pH. And that happens to be mosquitoes, black flies, midges. Uh, so it's very specific for uh, nuisance mosquitoes, uh, for mosquitoes, uh, and uh, has absolutely no effect whatever on humans. Uh, and uh, so you toss it in, into bodies of water, mosquitoes ingest it, the toxin uh, is liberated and, and kills the mosquito uh, because only the mosquito has the alkaline gut. <coughs> there is a uh, complementary product called a growth regulator or methoprene. It's a, it's a synthetic version of uh, a natural hormone that's required for development and in excess actually prevents development. Uh, and so that is tossed into the water uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's not as specific as uh, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, BTI. Uh, it will affect all other invertebrates. Uh, and in fact, there's some uh, controversy, not very well founded, that uh, the response to West Nile virus in Long Island, uh, all the methoprene going down the storm drains poisoned the lo lobster industry. Not, not true, but uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, suggestion that's out there uh, by people who don't want to see chemicals at all being used to uh, prevent mosquito uh, breeding. And then finally, the pupae, because they don't eat anything, uh, need to be attacked. And the only way to do that, uh, some of you may remember the old days when you could go and put a, a, a few uh, tablespoons of diesel on, the, the, on a body of water and suffocate mosquitoes. That same uh, technique is done, but you don't use diesel, you use a very highly refined light mineral oil. And that's only done when there are a lot of pupae around and you want to prevent an emergence. It's too late for a BTI or methoprene. One of the problems that we have is that everybody's view of mosquito control comes from this book, Silent Spring. 50 years old, it was actually published uh, in the fall, uh, the first copies came out in the fall of the year I was born. Uh, and uh, 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 put the focus on what we're putting out into uh, the woods. Uh, mainly as a result of agriculture, but uh, also a lot of it was uh, public health. Massachusetts has an interesting role in this in that it was a friend of hers in southeastern Mass uh, after a crop duster went over with DDT uh, for eastern equine encephalitis control, that stimulated her to look into the, the subject uh, and write this book that changed the, the face of, of uh, our country in terms of how we deal with pesticides. <coughs> but Rachel Carson herself said it, it, she's not saying you should never use it, but that we need to be careful doing it. And I'd like to point out, look at this car. This is a Ford from 1962. That's a Ford from two or three years ago. Your dad's car ain't on the road anymore, and, and things have changed. The way pesticides are applied are very different now. The same way that an engine gets gasoline uh, now is by a fuel injector. Back then, it was by a carburetor. And so technology has improved. It's much more precise today. Applications are very precise, very small amounts uh, per acre, uh, and in very uniform, small droplets. So you eliminate waste. You don't have a lot of it going into the environment. Uh, the wind speed and direction have to be a certain way to prevent drift, and you can calculate that today with uh, the machinery that, that is available. Temperatures have to be a certain, uh, uh, have to be a certain temperature. Uh, there's no sense wasting the product if mosquitoes are not active. And then finally, the EPA has mandated that organized mosquito control and pesticide applicators cannot apply until after sunset to reduce mortality to bees. Finally, everything's con computer controlled. In the old days, it was just some guy out there with a sprayer. So things are so different and it's rather unfair to uh, brand mosquito, have this idea of mosquito control that comes from Rachel Carson's days. And in fact, a lot of people say, well, what about the other insects? This uh, material kills other insects. It's true, it does. We've done some research on this. Uh, some of you may remember some tent-like uh, structures over on the Westboro side of the big field out there. We had these, what we call malaise traps out. 
uh, and uh, Central Mass Mosquito Control was kind enough to come out and spray uh, one or two times a month uh, uh, on, again, in Westboro. We weren't allowed to do this on the Grafton side because there's no spraying allowed in Grafton. Uh, we had this experiment up where half the traps got sprayed and half the traps didn't. Uh, and what would happen is that this is a, a thing where there's a net there, insects flying this way and insects flying in from the woods would be captured by hitting the net, crawling upwards, and then falling into a solution of alcohol. And this is a typical capture that we had. We ran these twice a week uh, for two months out of the year for three years. Uh, and uh, uh, a poor girl in our lab, a WPI student doing a major qualifying project, sorted half a million insects. And this is what we found. Yes, you see a little blip where, where everything is depressed. And so with, with the major groups of arthropods, yes, there is a little depression. But if they came right back very quickly. And so just like with the mosquitoes, any effect on the population is temporary. You get uh, reinvasion or rebreeding and replacement of what was killed. Now, the, the project has its nuances. We need to look, for example, at those things that don't reproduce very quickly and see what happens there. But at, at this level, there's nothing to indicate that we have long-lasting effects on the environment. This kind of argument hinders true public health interventions. Uh, when eastern equine encephalitis uh, levels are, uh, are, are uh, risk levels are elevated, the Department of Public Health has four uh, risk levels depending upon what is found in mosquitoes and whether there are horse and human cases. Uh, then uh, the Department of Public Health in consultation with the Department of Agricultural Resources, local mosquito control projects, and what we call the mosquito advisory group, I've just been appointed to the state's mosquito advisory group, uh, get together and determine whether the condition exists uh, and requires uh, drastic intervention. And the governor needs to sign the, the declaration of emergency that allows for aerial spraying. So it's, it's a big deal to have to do this. Uh, but uh, it has been done. But one of the problems is that the activists, the environmental activists say, well, you're killing all of the arthropods out there by doing this. You're poisoning the environment. Uh, <laughs> note, again, this is uh, Massachusetts history with eastern equine encephalitis. You'll see the number of cases and the number of deaths. And it doesn't seem like a lot compared to something like car accidents, but for the town in which it happens, it's a big deal. Westboro last year was horrified when one of their own uh, died of eastern equine encephalitis. And this is what happens. We, we did a study. We sorted nearly 20,000 uh, uh, insects from the same kind of design before and after the aerial spray in 2010. Uh, and we see that there is a, there is a, a decrease in the number of insects, uh, but it comes right back up again, and if anything, is more. And the diversity recovers as well. So we use an index of diversity as, as well and show the same recovery. So, uh, as with mosquitoes, any effect on insects is temporary. And then there's the, the, the idea, well, does spraying actually reduce risk? Uh, and it's awfully hard to measure that. You can do infection rates in mosquitoes before and after spraying. You can do numbers of mosquitoes before and after. And those are always uh, very valuable and always show efficacy. We also note, at least for last year, that uh, uh, all the cases that we saw came from outside the aerial spray zone. But this was a project we did last year where uh, there were two aerial sprays. Uh, and our hypothesis is, just like with anything else, older mosquitoes are more susceptible to injury than younger mosquitoes. It's just a general fact of life. I'm old. I, you know, if I get hit with a cold, I'm, I'm uh, more likely to be debilitated than I would have been 30 years ago. Uh, so one way of determining what the age of the mosquito is, is the only way is to dissect out the ovaries uh, and look and see whether the vessels surrounding the ovaries have been stretched. So they're coiled or stretched. So we dissected 600 mosquitoes from before and after the aerial spray uh, from inside and outside the spray zones. And we see that only the ones during, right after the spray, a, a day after the spray, uh, uh, we had more younger mosquitoes than older mosquitoes. Uh, and that shows us that the spray actually impacted older mosquitoes. And the reason that's important 
Mosquitoes are born uninfected, they take a blood meal, then they pass on what they acquired in that blood meal. New mosquitoes, never taken a blood meal, are harmless. And so we want to selectively get rid of the older mosquitoes if we can. So this, again, tells us that aerial spraying is a useful thing to do on top of all of the other data. Finally, so, so I, I've tried to highlight some of the research we, the Cummings School has been doing uh, to try to improve the health of people in, in Massachusetts. Uh, finally, I, I can't resist putting this up because as many of you know, I'm the nation's biggest advocate for killing deer to try to reduce the risk of Lyme disease. Well, there's another reason to reduce deer herds, and it's this. Where do mosquitoes come from? This paper was published a couple of years ago by the group at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station where they can use DNA techniques to determine what the mosquito fed on in its previous blood meal. It's a busy slide, but you can see that of all the, the species of mosquitoes that they looked at, deer served as the, the source of blood for virtually all of those mosquitoes. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we see more and more mosquitoes and mosquito transmitted infection and more and more deer up around people's homes. It's not, you know, people uh, contribute a little bit. You would think the family dog would contribute, but I think we've seen a change in the way we view dogs. That is that they're family and they don't sit outside anymore. They're sitting inside and they're not serving as sources of blood meals. It's deer. So deer reduction could help us in terms of reducing the number of blood meals and therefore the breeding of mosquitoes. So I've gone on a little uh, long. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge there are two, there's a foundation in uh, the North Shore uh, at uh, Beverly Hospital, Evelyn, Ling Evelyn Lilly Lutz Foundation, who has supported our work uh, on these. Uh, you know, we would never get uh, National Institutes of Health funding to do the, mosquito, the uh, insect counts, for example. Uh, or any of our other mosquito uh, ecology projects. We do have general uh, NIH money for other projects that helps support our laboratory. The Central Mass Mosquito Control Project is, is to be thanked for uh, 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 all of the advice and the, the great work that they do. Uh, point of information, I'm also commissioner for Central Mass Mosquito Control and we actually have the director of uh, Central Mass here in, in the audience today. Uh, but uh, the, the good folks there need to be thanked for their, all of their hard work. The State Reclamation Board of the Department of Agricultural Resources has been a, a tremendous uh, uh, source of information and, and uh, collaboration uh, in our research projects. Uh, Amanda Blom was the poor girl who sorted half a million insects. And then my colleagues, Tony Kashevsky and Rich Pollock, uh, both members of the Mosquito Advisory Group, and, and they were my colleagues at Harvard for 15 years uh, and have since moved on. They, they continue to work with me, and, and we're the ones who sat down in our basements dissecting 600 mosquitoes last year uh, after the aerial sprays. And so now I hope we, we, you will stick around and, 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 and ask questions, and I'm happy to stick around as long as I need to afterwards uh, for one-on-one -on -one, uh, questions if, if you need to. Yes. <clears throat> A lot of these people are, have scientific backgrounds. They're able to evaluate the information for themselves. There is information out there. They, some of them choose not to look at it. The EPA has fantastic amounts of information on all of the chemicals that are used. Anything that is used for mosquito control must be registered with the EPA. And so they, they have done toxicological studies, they've done environmental fate studies 
All of that information is there, and the problem is some of them say, well, you can't trust the government. Well, that elevates the discussion to a level that we really can't argue with. So, so I would certainly urge uh, everybody to do their homework and, and, and look at the, the relevant literature. And, and the big problem there is what is relevant literature? Uh, what is the scientific basis versus, well, this internet website site says this. Uh, the other is, is, is it's a matter of uh, understanding what is data and what is hearsay. There are a lot of people who stand up and say, well, uh, you know, one, one day the trucks came by and the next day I saw all these dead uh, fish. Well, that may have happened, but it needs to be documented and the cause needs to be established as being related to that truck as opposed to uh, some other event that caused that. So uh, uh, it needs to undergo the scrutiny of peer review. Uh, in order to be counted as data, otherwise it's what we call hearsay. Another thing is there's no way to fight against emotional arguments. In Grafton, we, we tried very hard to support the Board of Health, uh, the health agents' uh, uh, interest in, in joining, having Grafton join, and we were defeated by 10 votes or so. And what did it for, for that town meeting was a gentleman who had cancer and attributed his cancer to mosquito control. And the fact of the matter is, uh, it's hard to refute that argument. It could have been, but it could also have been uh, heavy metals in the woods around a, a major metal manufacturing plant in, in Grafton. It could have been something the, the, the person had seen previously. But how can you, you know, you can't deny that cancer is a terrible thing. All you can say is, well, we don't, there's no way to prove or disprove your statement. But that kind of argument carries a lot of weight. Uh, and so uh, uh, it, it's hard to, to, to fight those kinds of uh, uh, allegations. The things about bees, however, can be fought. Uh, like I said, any organized mosquito control must abide by the EPA labels. Uh, that is the law. Uh, you could lose your, your pesticide applicator license uh, for not doing so. And the EPA has, has determined that by app applying pesticides after dusk, you're greatly reducing any effect on pollinators. Uh, and so uh, if you question some of these people, it's, oh, well, you know, this was back in the 80s. Well, we don't deny that maybe early on there were some bee kills that happened, but today it doesn't happen. And there are other reasons for bee mortality that need to be sorted out. There are many things that kill bees. In fact, there's some beekeepers I know say it's because people fiddle with the bees too much. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, there's no question that these people are passionate, uh, that they care. Uh, about the environment and uh, of, uh, about bees and, and about people. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, they have an agenda and uh, it's awfully hard to, to actually respond to their arguments. But if you respond to it, it has to be on a science. We can only apply science and say this is what the scientific literature says. Often that's just not enough. Emotion carries the day. Certain background have a certain focus, 
you know, we can appreciate that, but you know, we have to deal with facts and the science at hand. And unfortunately, um, I feel in our script that um, there was misinformation given out that um, you know did cause the town to throw out those comments. You have a copy of well, I mean, he came out and made claims that um, as an MD, um, indiscriminate spraying is similar to giving um, um, uh, antibiotics to people with the common cold. In other words, you're going to build resistance. Now, first off, we don't do an indiscriminate spraying. We're doing small targeted spraying. And also, we do test for insecticide resistance. I have been doing so for over six years. And to this point, we have not found any insecticide resistance in any of the mosquitoes that we have trapped. So while it's a valid argument, especially down in the southern part of our country where insecticides are applied um, almost year-round. Up here, because of the um, amount of spraying which we do, the, the fact that it's small and targeted, and the fact that the majority of the year there is no insecticide being applied, we don't feel resistance will um, appear, but yet we still find it's a valid reason to test for it. Yes, ma'am. This is very hard for me to <clears throat> yeah, well, there's no legal ramifications for the homeowner. No, the p pesticide applicator has to have a license issued by the state, and, and if they deviate from the law, they lose that license. And so, but the, the, I, I do take issue with the idea that the chemicals are toxic. Uh, the EPA would not let them be sold in Home Depot if there were significant toxicity, even with over, over application. Uh, like I said, with DEET, you'd have to eat an ounce of it in order to get sick. Uh, with a lot of the granular or spray pesticides you get in Home Depot, you'd have to ingest about the same, more than that, in order to get any kind of ill effect. Uh, but, but you're right, it's, it's uh, interesting to, to note that, that uh, a lot of the people who pipe up at meetings like this and say, oh, pesticides used from mosquito control are terrible, go back home and then apply stuff to their tomatoes to make sure they have nice red tomatoes. <laughs> Yeah, you can, you can still buy malathion and the organophosphates in, in Home Depot, and, and none of the mosquito control projects use those anymore. Well, uh, I would like to see some Yeah, it, it's a, that's a good point. In fact, from now on, if I have to give this again, and I'm, I'm happy to do this every year, until, you know, that's what we're here about at, at this school is to educate. Uh, I'll add a slide saying, you know, look, there's no difference. The, this, the pyrethroids are the pyrethroids. You can buy the same stuff in Home Depot. Uh, we're not using any, uh, for mosquito control, we're not using anything more toxic. If anything, you all homeowners are applying more of it, and, and if anything, if there is any uh, risk to it, the environment, it's because of homeowners and golf courses and things like that. When I do my presentations, I do state that what we use are consumer available products. You know, Sam mentioned methylene, the grocery you live. Look in a flea tick product and putting on a dog or a cat, it's going to have methylene. Um, so there are a lot of <coughs> Similar type pesticide, the BTI that we use is a mosquito tongue, same exact uh, pesticide. We use a slightly different formulation for the granular. 
But as Sam states, you know, hybrid forage is the most widely used class of insecticide right now. Yeah. Because they have a, a fairly good ecological profile, they're fairly well tolerated by people. But I've talked to pesticide inspectors, and inevitably, what they fight against is the perception that more is better. With, uh, where someone, an uneducated person, or someone uneducated in pesticide use, reads a label and says one teaspoon per gallon, well, then two must be better. And that, of course, is false. I mean, the label is what you should be following the directions. Because more may not necessarily be toxic to us per se, but could have unintended consequences to the environment or insects that you're not trying to control. So that's where you know education and, and licensing, and of course, we buy ready to use formulations so that you know the mixing is taken right out of the equation. I think, the, I think also the point that you made about That's not to say you shouldn't apply it. It'd just be very careful in doing so. And, and I, I didn't mention anything specifically about dogs. There's a controversy about whether DEET is bad for dogs. Dogs get bitten by mosquitoes. Dogs can get heartworm. Dogs can get West Nile virus or Eastern equine encephalitis. Uh, you can do what I do uh, with repellent, which is put it on a, a bandana or something. And that will greatly reduce the number of mosquitoes, but also reduce any, if there is a hazard by application to skin of dogs, that'll reduce the risk to, to any dog. But the, the jury's still out on that. But uh, the point is, with infants, you could do the same thing, that instead of applying directly to skin, you put it on clothing or a bandana, or even better would be the mosquito net. But there, there comes a point when a kid is old enough, you know, they reach uh, uh, 30, 40 pounds, the, the repellent is not going to do them any harm. Uh, my kids uh, grab the repellent every time they go outside. They're five and, and seven, and, and they use it as they wish. Yes, Dick? Thank you for your comment, yeah. Well, you know, and, and I wish uh, uh, we could do this more often with more people because we need to spread the word. It's a probability thing. What, a lot of people have used the same argument with ticks. If you reduce the deer population by half, wouldn't the, the mosquitoes or ticks just double up on the remaining deer? But remember, with fewer deer, it means they're in, in fewer places. And so the probability of encountering mosqui a mosquito or a tick encountering a deer is reduced proportionally. So uh, in some places, maybe they do double up, but uh, uh, in the general scheme of things, there are fewer places where that's happening, and it probably uh, doesn't overall cause, uh, uh, you know, you still will have a net loss. But the other thing is that you, no one's saying that reducing deer by half is enough. I certainly don't. It's a step, but uh, you really have to reduce it down to uh, what it was like here before the colonists came. When the Indians were around, you had population densities of five to ten animals per square mile at the most. And we've got five to ten times that in some places. So uh, we just have an overabundance of deer, uh, and uh, uh, we need to bring it back down. We can't do that overnight, but then again, Lyme disease didn't appear overnight. It took 30 years for it to amplify and become a problem. And it might take 30 years for us to bring the deer population back down to a level where uh, most, a lot of us remember the time when Grafton didn't have a problem. 20 years ago, 15 years, 10 years ago, if people had said, oh, there are ticks out and behind my office down here at Building 20, I would have said, you're nuts. Uh, now I see deer out my uh, office window and I can get ticks in, in the woods next to my office. 10 years ago, it was hard. 15 years ago, it was impossible. Uh, that's because the deer started moving in and, and reproducing. The, the school has uh, no hunting on its property. The deer are smart. They know where to hide. <laughs> the Grafton people themselves know how good deer are to eat, so a lot of places don't have deer around Grafton. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do 
we don't. Uh, <clears throat> The suggestion is that because everybody has dogs on heartworm medication, and the other thing is that dogs aren't left outside all night anymore. You know, people bring them inside. That the, If one did a survey like that, the, the prevalence would be much lower. But heartworm prevalence is not studied here in Massachusetts, uh, at least in mosquitoes. Uh, we don't know. I would guess that it's pretty low. The other thing is that there are other reservoirs. Raccoons and, and coyotes uh, could also be serving as reservoirs for heartworm. And, and so those populations wax and wane too. Some years you have lots of them and then distemper or rabies comes through and gets rid of them. And so it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, but overall, I think the incidence of heartworm is far less than what it used to be. And, and there's really no excuse. Uh, you know, people have things that they can use to protect their dogs. Uh, and what happens in nature, well, we really don't care what the raccoons and coyotes get. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. Beth Daly uh, did a nice article on Lyme disease, and, and in fact, it's part of a seven article series. I think this has been number three, uh, and uh, is pointing out some of the controversies as well as some of the research and, and uh, 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 sociopolitics behind Lyme disease. And, and you're right, we could use a similar set of articles on mosquitoes and mosquito control and, and and, and in particular, at this time of year, how to protect yourself against mosquito bites. Uh, right now, the, 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 the burden is heavily upon local boards of health uh, to try to get the word out. Uh, and they, you know, they have so many other things they have to do, too. Well, we, we do have a reporter we sitting here. <laughs> Yeah, all of this information is available, and so it really it, it boils I mean, down it to a, the. It's a beautiful article. It has you know pictures of your backyard and what are potentially safe zones. And yeah. And it's just an attractive, beautiful article. Yeah, she she did a nice job. I've I've spent maybe three or four hours with Beth uh, daily on on that. So yeah. Yes, ma'am. Question on question on uh, Elle. Um, you had your uh, picture of the country where the prevalence is highest. It, you know, it looked like South Dakota, you know, in that area. You know, realizing that it started in New York and moved west. Yes. Has it gotten all the way west and then sort of settled out that way? Um, yeah. The, the question is whether uh, it, it, the, the map that was shown of West Nile incidents showed that a lot of the western states, and in particular the upper central uh, plains, uh, North and South Dakota, seem to be heavily afflicted. Uh, and that it, it did start in New York, and it moved very quickly across the country westward. And California, the western states are really some of the most uh, worst affected of, of any of the states. But it, it's almost as if it comes in waves because here in Massachusetts, West Nile virus disappeared for a few years, and now it's back. Last year, there was a lot of West Nile virus activity. And the question is, why is that? And one of the ideas is that uh, originally it came here, it wiped out all the birds and sort of burnt itself out. There were no more birds around to keep it going. And then it started moving westward. We don't really know why or how it moved westward so quickly. Uh, but it clearly had something to do with migratory bird patterns. Uh, although, as a bird, bird watchers tell me, there is no such thing as an east to west migration. Uh, but anyway, it burned itself out here, moved westward, and now we've had a whole new generation of birds which have not seen West Nile. So they're completely susceptible again, and now the virus can take hold and amplify, and perhaps the birds have adapted. So you've had natural selection so that they're not as badly affected, and so you have reduced levels of transmission. It's still around. Uh, uh, but it may not be as terrible as it was when it first got here. So, but it, it all rests upon this dynamic in, in nature, and, and nothing is constant. It constantly moves, and things evolve, 
to, to, to uh, 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 deal with uh, infection. And all of those modify what we see. But it doesn't mean we, can't, we can uh, let our guard down. We still have to protect ourselves. Okay, well, I, I thank you for coming. I, I'm happy to sit and, 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 and answer more questions. It's probably way more pleasant in here than it is outside. <laughs>